1984. Um, in one week, we have Karen Walker of the English department giving her lecture. The, the anticipation's building already. Uh, um, a paperweight in Shakespeare, Politics of Aesthetics in 1984. Uh, that's November 15th, one week from today, same place, same time. Uh, my name is Tony Ruiz, and so we have a panel today. Um, Eric Thompson of Philosophy, English, or right, Philosophy, Humanities, and Religion. Matt Murray and Ed Castellini of English, and I'm also with English. So our plan is to uh, have introductory remarks. We'll take several minutes each uh, to highlight ideas and discussion points. Okay, and we'll have a, we'll, we'll have some backing music at the same time. Um, and so we'll take several minutes of, to have to introduce some ideas, and then that should take about half an hour, 35 minutes maybe 40, um, and then we'll open up for, uh, for questions and our discussion. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, so um, if this is the first time you've read 1984, I imagine you arrive at a pretty de depressing ending to this novel, very bleak, bleak ending for Winston Smith and Julia. Um, what's fascinating about 1984 is how Orwell is able to conceive of this, of, of pure power and the mechanism towards power, the practices towards power. Uh, he's, he's quite ingenious, in fact. In fact, I find that the, the most fascinating part are the practices towards that power. Now, we, we come to understand that the, now, we, what we, we come to understand in part three, uh, through O'Brien, the mechanisms towards that power. Uh, for, and so there are a number of dimensions in how the party functions. And so for example, one of the elements that O'Brien um, explains is how older oligarchies, older um, um, uh, totalitarian states actually failed because of their imperfection, their, their misunderstanding of power. And so um, he gives the example, of course, of the power over minds. And uh, so uh, the, it's not, the, the problem with Winston or is, is not that, I mean, they don't execute Winston. Let me say that again. Winston uh, is captured and not executed. And so they're not so much interested in his execution. They're pr particularly interested in, in destroying the rebellion in his mind. Um, so in fact, one of, one of the lines from the novel is, power is in tearing human minds to pieces. And so O'Brien gives the example of um, a, a few examples of, um, of, of oligarchies and their failures, one of them being the failure of controlling minds. And so I wanted to take a look at just one um, particular passage uh, briefly in order to uh, kind of def uh, illustrate his thinking. This is on page 255 of the novel. Even in the victim of the Russian purges could carry rebellion locked up in his skull as he walked down the passage waiting for the bullet. But we make the brain perfect before we blow it out. Blow it out. The command of the old despotism was thou shalt not. The command of the totalitarians was thou shalt. Our command is thou art. And so we arrive at the end of the novel um, with the obliteration of the rebellion in both Julia and Winston, the complete annihilation of their individuality or will towards rebellion. Now, this is certainly a satire. We, we have um, the conception of power to the extreme. Um, however, you know, one of my questions is how uh, Orwell leaves us in this novel, how he leaves, how he leaves the question of resistance and rebellion. Now, uh, again, this is a in some, in some ways an extreme version of pure power. However, uh, it, it, I think it's, it's needs to be considered that um, for both Julia and uh, Winston, both of them in parts one and two of this novel, uh, enacting some form of re rebellion, but that rebellion is essentially snuffed out um, um, in, under the complete control of the party. In fact, one of the great lines at the very end is, if you, if you want a vision of the future, imagine a boot stamping out a human face forever. So my question is, how does 
Orwell conceive of resistance. He leaves us with this very bleak picture um, where it seems like a hopeless situation. But I, I do think that he does, he does leave, leave us to question forms of resistance, forms of rebellion. So that's my question for us today, is how, how we might understand that, how uh, rebellion manifests itself. Now, let me add that, um, that early in the novel, Winston again and again um, observes that um, if there is hope, it lies in the prose. If there is hope, it lies in the prose. However, the, the prose, for the, most, I mean, for the most part, are, are, are powerless and in servitude. In fact, it, this, is, you know, this is part of the, where satire comes into play. The, the pro, we have a caricature of working class life um, in the prose. Of they, there is no sense of political rebellion or political thought in the prose. Um, they're controlled by the party. For the most part, they're portrayed as mainly interested in these low culture pursuits. Of, of sports and drinking, and um, they're social engineered through, you know, uh, the production of porn and film, all by the party. So, if if hope lies in the proles, Orwell doesn't clearly give us how that might work. So, um, my question again is how we understand resistance and rebellion um, at the at the end of the novel. Now, so that that would be a discussion point. Uh, now, I, I, in fact, do think that um, or Orwell does leave us with um, some ideas regarding resistance. Um, certainly, this discussion today would be one example of that, right? But, uh, but within the novel, how does he leave this question of resistance? Um, so that, that would be my discussion point for us today um, as one line of thought. So um, we have th three, three more speakers. and. Um, okay. Ed, you want to go ahead and go? Great. This is Ed Castellini from the English Department. Well, hello. And the first question I wanted to just ask uh, the audience today is, uh, raise your hand if you finished 1984. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Good. Okay. Uh, then I can, uh, I'll just proceed without fearing that I'll spoil the ending for anybody. Okay. Now, um, on page 34 of the novel, um, Orwell writes this. He says, um, he says, the party said that Oceania had never been in alliance with Eurasia. He, Winston Smith, knew that Oceania had been in alliance with Eurasia. But where was this knowledge? Only in his own consciousness, which in any case must soon be annihilated. Uh, and as you know, that does happen in the book. And if all others accepted the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into history and became truth. Quote, who controls the past, ran the party slogan, controls the future, and who controls the present controls the past. So this is a major uh, part of the book, right? Um, how, how are individuals controlled or constrained or limited or actually deprived of their full humanity if they don't know their own past, right? Or if they don't know the past of their city or the past of their country or the past of even the recent history, right? And you remember what, um, you remember what uh, Winston's job was? Winston's job was producing fake news. Uh, sorry to use a phrase that uh, is presently current. <laughs> Uh, a fake news purveyor. <laughs> and the whole party is involved in a vast fake news um, scheme. Okay, in fact, fake news uh, can be outdated as much as uh, like uh, two days ago. And we have to change the past for in two days. And they can, they can actually do that. All right. Now, um, so the question is, um, how, uh, what effect does this have on individuals? Now, uh, I'd like to read you something that um, was written in Time Magazine uh, three weeks ago. This is a quote from Ai Weiwei. Um, I don't know if you, he's too familiar with you. He's a very famous activist um, from, uh, from China, from the People's Republic of China. And he, here he says, if you see what happens in China, the party constantly changes reality and history to its own favor, which really establishes a totally tyrannical control. So as you see, um, other countries have the slogan 
uh, of the party too, who controls the present, controls the past. And um, if you really uh, study this, you'll see that this whole idea of uh, the truth of the past has become quite a um, uh, loaded question. For example, um, we have the famous um, word that Stephen Colbert coined. Do you remember what that is? Truthiness? There's no such thing as truth, there's just truthiness. Okay? And uh, I think that the word truthiness was invented to cover things in America like a, um, a famous deponent and ex-president saying, well, it depends on what the meaning of the word is, is. So, truthiness. <laughs> so, um, now, um, so in 1984, a um, little poem occurs in, in, on, um, in four places in the book. And when I was reading it, I said, now, why would Orwell uh, recite, or why would Orwell put lines from a child's nursery rhyme, basically a child's nursery rhyme, in 1984? What was it doing there, and why does he, why is it so important? So if you re remember the nursery rhyme, it goes, uh, oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. I owe you three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. When will you pay me, say the bells of Old Bailey. When I grow rich, say the bells of Shoreditch. And then at the end of the song goes, and here comes a candle to light you to bed, here comes a chopper to chop off your head. Right? And the final irony is, of course, that um, he learns the, the part about the chopper uh, from one of the members of the thought police who was about to chop off his head, literally, right? I mean, deprive him of his brain, which is like chopping off your head, right? <laughs> now, um, I, was, I was to give a, a much longer lecture on this, uh, and I have some um, slides that I prepared, but um, unfortunately, they don't, um, I'm gonna have to ask the um, help up there, because uh, they don't quite show up on the thing down here, so. What is, the, what is the first slide that you have there? Go ahead and put that on, if you don't mind. Okay, under London. Now, London is the most amazing city. Um, I don't know whether you've uh, been there or not, but it's basically a historical museum. Uh, in fact, this article, uh, National Geographic, is very interesting. Uh, uncovering the city's buried past, they, they actually have found um, remains from back to 11, thousand BC uh, that the site was inhabited and it was London was the capital of, of uh, Britannia in the Roman Empire uh, London Bridge was actually built by the Romans first and uh, see the different you see the different levels and I called my uh, lecture uncovering the city's buried past because that's what Winston has to do to find any, any part of the truth which has been totally obscured by the party, he has to actually uncover London's buried past. And how does he do this? It turns out that he does it through a children's nursery rhyme. So what the next slide? Gotta click <laughs> oh, uh, no, um, no cut, cut away from that and just go to the uh, ones that were right on my um, flash drive. That, that one of the children's game, I think. <clears throat> oh. <clears throat> I think when I do the lecture, it'll be better. Well, okay. Uh, does that... Um... Okay, so we'll start with this. This is the children's game. And um, you, passed, you passed underneath it saying, oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clemens. And you kept doing that. And then when you got to the end, it said, here comes a chopper to chop off your head. Down, down comes the arms. And the child that's caught in between there has, has her or his head chopped off, right? Winston is listening to all this very closely because <laughs> it, it's his fate too. Okay, the next one. Now, uh, what are the bells of London? Well, this is an example. So when you hear oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clemens, 
That's actually one of the bells of St. Clement's Church. And um, oranges and lemons is the sound of the bells in that particular church. Oranges and lemons, see, whatever it, whatever it is. And then the next church will have a slightly different sound. So that one of the city of London, please. <clears throat> uh, well, if that were clear, that would be city of London. But you know how London weather is, so. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, all you need to see from this is there's a lot of church steeples in London, <laughs> right? And uh, so you had to have a song that differentiated uh, mm. the steeples, churches. Sorry. It's a great slide. Come back for the, come back for the full measure. <laughs> all right. And uh, so you told uh, the difference between the bells by, the, uh, by this child's nursery rhyme, right? And as far as chopping off your head goes, London was also famous for chopping off your head. That was how King Henry VIII, for example, remember, disposed of several wives and how um, other tyrants in England disposed of their political enemies. So chopping off your head is an old London game. Okay. Now, just for the last one, could you put on that little video of the, um, of the uh, uh, music score? <clears throat> so we actually have the um, original music and the original score of this. Okay, uh, you can go ahead and run it. Oranges and lemons. children's lines in there, but that actually is the old melody to that uh, lovely song. And, okay, so, and here's what um, Winston, Winston Smith says. He said, it was curious, but this rhyme kept running, running through his head, oranges and lemons. <clears throat> it was curious, but when you said it to yourself, you had the illusion of actually hearing bells, the bells of a lost London that still existed somewhere or other, disguised and forgotten. From one ghostly steeple after another, he seemed to hear them peeling forth. Yet so far as he could remember, he had never in real life heard church bells ringing. So it's a very interesting passage in the book. And if you just remember this little song, Oranges and Lemons, you'll, um, be, you'll have something to remember uh, of the whole um, impetus of the party to impose uh, thought control, reality control, double think, and, uh, um, and its slogan, remember? Who controls the present controls the past. Who controls the past controls the future. Okay, thanks. thanks <coughs> Do you want to go next? Do you want Doesn't to, matter. Do you to, okay. yeah. do you want to flip for it? Do you want to? Want to <laughs> go for it, Eric. All right. Uh, great stuff. So, um, 
a student gave me some time ago this Che Guevara hat, which he got in Cuba, and I've been looking for an opportunity to wear it. <laughs> um, so uh, the uh, one thought, I have a kind of a, oh, just one, I want to foreground three characters, and which, um, which I read as uh, Orwell contrasting for us three different kinds of responses to the kind of power that Big Brother represents uh, to uh, three different kinds of rebellion. Um, but I'll start by saying this. Uh, the, this is a, a classic work, a work of true literary merit, partly because it's so applicable to so many different things. Um, Orwell's context was uh, the, the Cold War and um, Stalinist the Soviet Union, but, uh, but the, the government of Big Brother in Oceania is recognizable in any structure of power, isn't it? Uh, you know, it, the, the um, themes, the ideas, the, uh, the language of 1984, which by the way, I'm gonna quote a couple of passages and I just have to say that I'm using a different edition. I'm not in the English department, so I have my own edition, which I purchased in 1984. When I was in college, that's when I first read it. Um, and uh, so my page numbers are different. What are you going to do? Uh, so um, I think of uh, Rush Limbaugh, for example, using the thought police as a way of identifying the evils of uh, liberalism, of you know, Barack Obama and, and so on. Um, it, it, it's a, applicable so many different places, right? And just like Hitler, Big Brother is often the charge used of any, uh, about any regime of power by any of their detractors, right? So liberals call conservatives Big Brother and conservatives call liberals Big Brother. I think one of the reasons, some, sometimes it's, it's actually more applicable than at other times, but it, it, one of the things that makes it work is that what Orwell has unpacked for us is a, is a part of the piece of the human condition, right? All systems of power at, at some point have the potential to be Big Brother-ish. And so I'm, you know, I, I see this in our government right now. There's lots of analogies to Trump and we can all talk about that, I'm sure we will. But, you know, I, I find, I struggle, I'm not only a faculty member here, but I'm also the Academic Senate President, and, um, and so I uh, struggle with people in power that occupy positions that oversee, in, you know, in the legislature of California and the, and the uh, governance structure of the community college system. And I see some of this wielding of power in those places. And uh, so, um, I, but I, I really like the, I like the rebellion. I don't like the ending. I don't think anybody does, right? But um, I think that it's interesting, the characters, three characters that, um, that are, that have really different kinds of responses in rebellion, in resistance to the party. Winston, obviously, Julia, and O'Brien. And it's kind of ironic that I'm using O'Brien that way. But um, those three characters, I think, represent three different modalities. Um, so Julia, one, one of the most interesting phrases in the, in the book that strikes me, um, in the long conversation between Winston and Julia is they've just, they've just been making love. They're in, laying in, around in bed and talking about these things. And, and he makes several remarks. She, she doesn't get, right? You remember this? She doesn't get his concern about the party's rewriting of history. He, she doesn't understand. She just simply doesn't comprehend why it's significant that he found a piece of tangible evidence that he held in his fingers, a newspaper article that proved if it were retained, it proved that the party rewrites history and suppresses the past. It didn't even matter to her. And he characterizes her this way. He says on my page uh, 129, you're a rebel only from the waist downward. <laughs> right? Uh, for her, the, the party represents rules that infringe on, on, her, on her freedom of her sensuality, of, of her animal needs. And so that's the level of 
of her rebellion, right? She breaks the rules, and she's brilliant at devising ways, uh, little ways to get away with breaking the rules, mainly rules that have to do with things like sex. And, um, and so he, Winston, muses about her that the, the best way to appear to be orthodox, he says at one point, about her, is to be ignorant of really what orthodoxy means. If you don't really understand it, then it, it's, it's easy for her to parrot it and to appear to be orthodox for the telescreens. So that's one kind of rebellion set against Winston's, right? Winston's is an intellectual kind of rebellion, whereas Julia's is a sensual one. So Winston, Winston is intimately concerned and, and uh, obsessed throughout the book with, the, with truth, right? And he, he says at one point, as long, at page 69 in my text, um, that eventually he said, you know, pro proleptically, that the party would declare that two plus two is five. And he says, freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four. If that is granted, all else follows, right? And so as, as, a, as a member of the Ministry of uh, Records, he's, he's constantly um, uh, occupied with this particular concern and others around him like Julia don't have that don't share that same concern they come from a, an entirely different place and then O'Brien the scene with o, the scenes with O'Brien are really interesting to me O'Brien first presents himself as a member of the brotherhood right and so they have the the uh, Julia and Winston come to O'Brien's place and he indoctrinates them and, and in, kind of inducts them into the, the brotherhood. And O'Brien's is kind of a purely a structural and political kind of rebellion that he pre presents to them. And uh, Orwell uses the word, uh, when O'Brien starts his litany um, of the things that they have to be prepared to do if they join this resistance, this rebellion, um, on my page uh, 142, um, he call, it, 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 Orwell calls it a catechism. I think that's significant. Does everybody know what a catechism is? Everybody over 40 does, right? <laughs> um, and everybody under 40 probably not. Uh, and, and so then he goes on. Uh, he, I'll read the passage, page 142 in my ancient text. Um, and so uh, he began asking his questions in a low, expressionless voice, as though this were a routine, a sort of catechism, most of whose answers were known to him already. So a catechism, briefly, is a, a religious text that is usually comprised of questions and answers that teach a new convert, or in some cases a child, the doctrine of the church in the form of, and uh, being asked questions and then answering them correctly. And this is a, a technique that has been used to indoctrinate children in religion, in Christianity particularly since at least the second century. Um, and so then he, he goes on this litany. Are you prepared to give your lives? Yes. Are you prepared to commit murder? Yes. To commit acts of sabotage which may result in the death of hundreds of innocent people? Yes. To betray your country and to foreign powers? Yes. You are prepared to cheat, to forge, to blackmail, to corrupt the minds of children, to distribute habit-forming drugs, to encourage prostitution, to disseminate venereal diseases, to do anything which is likely to cause demoralization and weaken the powers of the party? Yes. Right? A catechism. And so uh, O'Brien, as we know, it turns out that O'Brien is not really a rebel, that uh, but he, but he, it kind of implies that he was, right? Um, when, when he walks into the torture room and Winston finally realizes what's going on, um, uh, he says, oh, they got, Winston says, they got you too. And O'Brien says, oh, they got me long, a long time ago, right? So I think what, what I suspect Orwell's setting up here is that O'Brien's form that he presents to them, it, it turns out to be a betrayal and a, and a deception, but what he presents to them is a form of rebellion that is the, simply the mirror image of the party. It, it's, it's the party in reverse, right? It's just on the other side of ideology, but it's the same basic idea, it's the same basic technique. 
right? So that's something I think that uh, I'd like to hear more about. Some maybe uh, uh, someone can form a question about this, right? The, the different different modes of resistance to this kind of power. Uh, the sensual, the intellectual, and the political, the structural. Um, so, those are my thoughts. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> I think I'm just going to stay here just to be rebellious. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what I've been focusing on over the last uh, couple of weeks as we've been making our way through uh, 1984 in my uh, 1A class is sort of the, uh, what I've been titling, at least in my mind, the known and the unknown. What can be known, what can't be known, uh, and this goes uh, in a lot of different directions. In fact, almost every page of the novel, you'll see Winston uh, saying something like, or the, the uh, I should say the narrator, uh, says, Winston did not know, or Winston knew, or Winston couldn't know, possibly this, or maybe this. Uh, there's a, a constant dilemma with, with what Winston can know. Uh, and of course, uh, I, to sort of trace my thinking along uh, this lines, I, I, one of my original uh, fascinations uh, as I was reading the novel this time was to think about it in terms of uh, panopticism, thinking about the, the telescreens and how they are used to know uh, by the party. They're a, a, a technology that is used to gain knowledge, right? So uh, that led me, of course, uh, to, uh, to, to doing uh, some, some reading of Foucault, thinking about uh, you know, specifically his uh, work, Discipline and Punish, which is really uh, a fabulous way to, to read this novel hand in hand uh, with Foucault's uh, examination of how power works. I think uh, almost all of our uh, discussions have come back to that at some point or another. Uh, the, the, the mechanisms of power uh, and uh, how power exerts itself or, or presents itself. Uh, so, <clears throat> One of the other things that I kept coming back to is that, that this knowledge, this knowing or not knowing, often relates back to bodies, human bodies, and how bodies can be read, or how they can resist being read, or how they can present disinformation, uh, as in the case of Julia, where she's able to, to masterfully mask her rebellion in many ways, uh, and how others like Winston are living in a constant fear uh, that their inner thoughts will be known. How will those thoughts be known? Mm. By the body, right? The telescreens uh, can even, you know, he's even afraid to, uh, when his back is turned to the telescreen because even his body language can speak about uh, what he is thinking, what's going on in, this, in his skull, right? Uh, so, so how does power do this? Uh, of course, Foucault talks about it in a lot of different ways, uh, everything from torture uh, to uh, imprisonment. And uh, one of the things, uh, a couple of different things that I uh, was focusing on uh, from Foucault's Discipline and Punish are the use of uh, how, how space is organized. Uh, one thing uh, being how people are partitioned. Right? And there's a lot of different ways that the, the people uh, in, this, uh, in this world of the novel that we encounter are partitioned, uh, whether you're uh, the party and the proles, the inner party versus the outer party. Um, even in the living spaces, uh, people are partitioned amongst the others in the, uh, the apartment buildings, uh, in their workspaces even. Winston doesn't even know most of the people that he works with by name, right? He's not even able to, uh, to know who they are as individuals. He just knows that they are working there at the Ministry of Truth alongside him. He can guess perhaps what they're up to, and in some cases his guesses are accurate and others uh, maybe not so accurate. Um, so I kept thinking about, you know, what does Winston know? What does he not know? And also then you have to think about the party. What can they know? What can they not know? What, what are the machinations of their knowing or their, their, uh, the ways that they attempt to know? And uh, what are the limits uh, of that knowledge? Even coming to the very end when, uh, uh, when Winston is being uh, tortured and interrogated by O'Brien, uh, Winston, uh, will be thinking something, and O'Brien immediately knows 
what it is uh, that he's thinking. How is O'Brien able to read that? How is he able to know that? Uh, and it's, it's a really fascinating conundrum. Maybe we can do some, uh, some talking about that. So there's this uh, partitioning of people uh, so that you don't, you don't even know who, who could be a friend, even someone you could have a real conversation with, a real relationship with. None of these things are possible. Even the families are afraid of each other, their own children. Uh, so there's a kind of partitioning that happens in many different uh, ways. The other is, of course, the idea of the Panopticon, uh, the uh, sort of, uh, of course, it was originally developed as a system uh, to supervise prisoners. Uh, the idea developed by Jeremy Bentham uh, to, to build architecture, architecturally think about how to design a prison so that uh, prisoners can be monitored at all times. Of course, part of the key to that uh, system was to devise a way that a prisoner would not know at any moment whether they are being monitored, uh, whether there is surveillance actually happening, but that they have visual you know, reminders of that surveillance all the time. Right? So that those two pieces work together. They always have to assume that they are being watched. So that we see the same thing happening here in the novel, right? That uh, everywhere Winston goes, Everywhere, even when he's uh, meeting with Julia, when they're hanging out in the, uh, the partition of London that is exclusively, uh, at least supposed to be the realm of the proles, uh, they have to be constantly on guard because it's not just the telescreens, it's the thought police, whoever they may be, or these uh, children spies, or different kinds of ways that they can be monitored at all times or they can be discovered uh, at all times. Um, so, uh, So maybe I'll just read one uh, short passage uh, from uh, Foucault's description of how the architecture of the Panopticon is intended to be used. Uh, so the, it was addressing a problem. Uh, a whole problematic then, problematic then develops of an architecture uh, that's designed to permit an internal, articulated, and detailed control to render visible those who are inside it. In more general terms, an architecture that would operate to transform individuals, to act on those it shelters, to provide a hold on their conduct, to carry the effects of power right to them, to make it possible to know them, to alter them. And I see it seems like that's part of what's going on uh, ultimately with O'Brien. You know, they're, they're not satisfied uh, ultimately even just to control Winston's body that the, there seems to be an insistence also then of altering him, of controlling his mind. Even that place that Winston is, is believing up until the very end, that his, there's a sacred space inside this skull that no one can violate. And even that is taken from him, uh, ultimately. Uh, so not to get us back to this depressing uh, ending again. But, uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, just thinking about the known and the unknown and the ways in which we, uh, or at least the, the characters and the other uh, uh, parts of the novel sort of explore uh, this question. So. Thank you. Okay. Very good. So, um, uh, so we can op open up for, for questions um, or just uh, insights into the novel. Um, uh, just, just to add on top of that, uh, because we've looked at the Panopticon too in, in my classes, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and I encourage you to look it up because it's a great way to kind of understand um, some of the ideas we've been s discussing. You have this ideal prison uh, with the um, guard tower in the middle, and it's round, you know, in the middle of this circle, and you're looking into the cells. The prisoners can't see the guard tower, the guards in the tower, so, but they know they're under surveillance, they know they're being seen. And, uh, and part of that, the punishment, is the self-regulation, um, the, the self-discipline based on knowing they're being seen, but never knowing when they're being seen. Uh, and so you, if you were to go online and look at the pictures, uh, oh. um, you would see um, there were various versions of the Panopticon. It was never built because, uh, well, a number of reasons, but I think some prisoners wouldn't care about breaking the rules in any case. But, uh, so, um, uh, so any questions or observations in terms of some of these subjects? I, let's just open it up. And could I add, add that um, we have two mics uh, in the aisles, so if you uh, would, uh, if you wanna ask a question or make a comment, uh, come to the mic, please, and, um, and if that's really, really difficult, if you shout loud, because we're being recorded, by the way, that should be known too, right? Um, uh, we're being recorded, and so we can, we can also repeat, repeat into the mic your question, 
or your comment from here too, but we, the best scenario would be if it's, if it's convenient to go to a mic. Thanks. Eric? The man next to you. Matt. Oh, Matt. Matt. Um, <laughs> since you spoke about Foucault, and I hope this isn't too far off topic, does Foucault make references to the Nazi occupation in a similar manner that Orwell might to perhaps Stalinism? That's a good question, and I don't know if I'm enough of a Foucaultian scholar to be able to uh, to answer that directly. I don't recall a specific moment from Discipline and Punish where he explores that, um, but certainly uh, I think we could certainly see some parallels. Great, great. Step right up. Step right up. <laughs> step right up. I, I got and I got more to say <laughs> for what we're waiting. But here comes one. Hey, okay. Uh, I may misremember. It's been a while since I read 1984 last. But it seemed to me primarily a psychological book. It seemed its primary interest seemed to be in the psychology of the people who were under the hold of the uh, empire that they lived in. And the genesis of the empire was not, uh, was only sketchily addressed in terms of geopolitics and so right. on. And I think, uh, for example, in comparison with that of a book like um, Hannah Arendt's book about totalitarianism, in which she derives, uh, follows uh, the development of totalitarianism from the dehumanization of, uh, of, of colonialism, where people learned to be inhuman in their treatment of the locals, the colonials. Um, but her understanding is about the evolution of the totalitarian society uh, as a transient phenomenon that depended on these historical uh, conditions. Um, so what's, what's your view of, uh, of, of Orwell's understanding of the genesis and, and future history of uh, totalitarianism as he saw it? Well, I, I could give you uh, Orwell's answer. Uh, you, may, you may remember that he gets a book um, from um, O'Brien. And the book is basically the, um, the historical evolution of the party and a big brother. And in that, uh, he says, well, you know, we're basically, basically, we're building on the Nazis and uh, Stalin's communism, right? So all of their uh, brutal ways of um, enforcing a police state um, are being basically followed by the party with, with but then O'Brien has actually written this book. He says, but with the, with the um, further condition that now we have perfected the means of totalitarian control. Uh, so, um, I think that that's kind of interesting. When I read it, I said, oh yeah, so the party is building on the, you know, quote unquote, successes of the past, if you could call Stalinism a success, you see? And um, um, I, I think that's really part and parcel of the book, too. I mean, Orwell had lived through uh, Nazism and was a great student of Stalin's, um, a, cr a critic of Stalin's work. Uh, um, picking up on the point, the psychological point, um, the, the, uh, there was a, there's a newspeak word that corresponds to a word I learned in theology uh, seminars in graduate school. Um, and the newspeak word is face crime. Right? This is one of, one of the things, Winston, there's several passages in which he's, he's got to tightly control what his face does in front of a telescreen, right? Um, because if uh, you show the, you, it's not completely emotionless, you have to show the right emotion at the right time, right? You have to properly hate during two minutes of hate and during hate week, and so you have to properly, you have to respond 
with the appropriate happiness. I, I love that face crime. Um, I had a. Uh, I mentioned religion earlier. I, you know, it, 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 the the social obviously the social context is primarily Stalinism and and with with Nazism there. You know, the the leader of the rebellion is is Emmanuel Goldstein, right? So the, the, that's. Uh, probably a reference, um, but the uh, the Big Brother, the system of B Big Brother, just as closely resembles the medieval Roman Catholic Church as it does any other totalitarian system, right? And so uh, often religious systems uh, can function this way. Um, it, I had a theology professor who was talking about the word orthodoxy. Uh, orthodoxy is a, originally a religious word, right doctrine, right thinking. Um, but my theology professor was expositing different styles of religion, and he was talking about Pentecostal religion. And um, in, in, a, in a certain kind of Pentecostal situation, they're not so concerned with right thinking as with right feeling. <clears throat> with showing the right emotions at the right time. And if you fail to do that, there's something wrong with you and you will be approached. It's monitored. And he coined the word for that, orthopathy, right? Pathy from the Greek word pathos, feeling, right? So there's, um, and this is incorporated in Newspeak and in the, the party, right? Um, so they're monitoring not only what you think, but what you feel and how you show it on your face. Um, so I think that there's, it, it's, it's deeply psychological, I think. And, and there is that sketch of the, of the history in Goldstein's book, but it's mainly psychological, yeah. So I, I guess my question's a bit complicated, but uh, it's more with how Orwell has so accurately predicted what's happened today. Oh, yeah. So like, he wrote this in the 40s. First of all, he predicted, he predicted the wide use of helicopters, which is rather impressive. Uh, but how he accurately predicted how wars are used as excuses for mass control. So like in today's world, like how airports have gone from you walk in and you go to the gate to now you go through security because one attack happened, so everything has to be controlled like that. And we don't question it. We just sort of accept that everything's changed because of one event, and it needs to stay that way to prevent those future events. So my question is, yeah. how do you think that Orwell so accurately predicted how totalitarian states would control their people, and especially in the modern world, because it's not like they're the same as how it was with like the Soviet Union or with the Nazi regime, because uh, they do it with media and stuff too now, which is very accurate to how uh, Orwell predicted it. So, like, very good. Great question. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, well I'll, I'll just Go. start. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I was just saying that you know, in this satire, there's a great deal of exaggeration, but um, but Orwell was very much aware of how power worked. Um, he early in his life, he worked for the police in Burma or or the milit part of the uh, British rule in Burma. So he he witnessed firsthand um, the dehumanizing practices of the British in their colonies, um, and so and this is in the, th in the 1930s. Uh, he was very much aware of, obviously, this is post-war, so he was aware of, um, of power in, in you know, Germany and the rise of the Soviet Union. Um, I mean, so we can say that there's a great deal of, uh, of things that are over the top in the novel, but really, he's right on on all of this. I mean, in fact, the torture of, uh, of Winston, you know, with the rat, I hate to give it away to people, but with the rat and the cage on his head and everything, I think we, uh, he understood that Governments have ingenious ways to torture people, um, and we've certainly seen that ever since. So there's, there was a lot of truth there already in, in the history that, was, um, that he was drawing from. And I, I think there's a line of thought from, you know, uh, from a several, several of those areas. Yeah. Um, the um, People's Republic of China has perfected what's called the uh, 
great firewall. Have you heard that phrase? You, you can't text into um, mainland China. You uh, are monitored in your texts. Um, if you express a thought, um, there's um, thousands and thousands of uh, monitors and people behind the monitors who, will, who are uh, out looking for um, uh, thought that deviates from the party's control. And uh, they will actually arrest you today. So, so the great firewall, be, be a good subject to uh, do a paper on, actually. <laughs> The, I, there are several things. There's some things you got wrong too, but um, and the, some things have taken on different forms. But there's a, a lot right. The, the collapse of all of the different cultures and nations into big conglomerate global kind of um, situations. I, I just want to read a passage. This is something that struck me in this third time I've, I've read it. Uh, something that struck me. Um, I'm reading a passage where Winston is talking about Julia. I alluded to it earlier. Uh, he says, talking to her, he realized how easy it was to represent an appearance of orthodoxy while having no grasp whatever of what orthodoxy meant. In a way, the worldview of the party imposed itself most successfully on people incapable of understanding it. They could be made to accept the most flagrant violations of reality because they never really fully grasped the enormity of what was demanded of them and were not sufficiently interested in public events to notice what was happening. By lack of understanding, they remained sane. They simply swallowed everything and what they swallowed did them no harm because it left no residue behind, just as a grain of corn will pass undigested through the body of a bird. Trump voters. <laughs> Sorry. I just, it strikes me as being something that, that goes in the direction. Sorry. I, I hope I didn't offend anyone. But um, it's something that goes in the direction of, of, explaining, of explaining that to me. I, I think that's something that was very prescient on Orwell's part. I think, too, uh, it is, as we read the book, tempting to see it as a prediction of the future. I think, you know, it's also important to see, as I, I think you guys are underscoring, that he was describing the, the world that was already in existence uh, right. in many ways. Uh, that, you know, uh, if you get a chance to read his book, Homage to Catalonia, it's a really wonderful uh, yeah description of his experience, not only as a journalist during the Spanish Civil War, but also uh, eventually he uh, became involved with the fighting itself. And in his attempts to report on what was happening, being there on the ground, uh, sometimes uh, near the fighting, sometimes maybe uh, a few uh, city away or something like this, he was realizing uh, you know, how difficult it was for anybody, no matter how you know, close in proximity you were to the actual battles, for anybody to know really what was happening was almost impossible. So that the news reports that were coming out in the, in the papers about uh, what was happening in the, in the Spanish Civil War were often really just uh, reproducing what the, uh, the various uh, powers uh, released uh, to the media, basically, without any sort of uh, actual on-the-ground reporting to back any of that up. Hello. Um, I'm thrilled about um, O'Brien, and so I wonder um, what do you guys think um, O'Brien's role in the novel essentially is? Is that of an intellectual, spiritual leader, torturer, many, all of those combined? And if perhaps uh, O'Brien resembles an element in overall literature, such as the dragon is some common symbol that represents something in all of literature. Hmm. We're stumped, no. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Yes. <clears throat> well, you, you know, O'Brien's very interesting because remember, uh, Winston keeps saying he loved him, right? Or right from the start, he felt this great attraction to O'Brien, you know? And, um, and then he dreams about O'Brien. 
which I think is very interesting. So, um, and Winston tries to analyze it, and he says, well, it was O'Brien's intelligence that attracted him. Something, uh, some, uh, O'Brien was actually a man who seemed to think, whereas everybody else in the society was parroting orthodoxy or letting the corn pass undigested <laughs> through the system. <laughs> and um, so perhaps that, that's a part of it. Um, and then, you know, this, I, um, the, the sentence that um, you brought up, um, O'Brien says, uh, Winston says to O'Brien, um, so they've got you too. And O'Brien says, they got me long ago. So there is some kind of sy sympathy between those two people. And O'Brien displays a very interesting relationship to Winston. He, he kind of likes him in, in some way, you know? Yeah, I think O'Brien is an interesting and, and complex character. It, um, I, as I said earlier, he, he, to me, to my reading, he, he represents um, a, a way that this works, a way of dealing with it, that is, um, he, he he has intelligence, there's a connection, right? One of the earliest things reported is the connection that Winston feels for O'Brien and, and, and wants, longs for, to unpack that. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, when he finds, so when he finally does, then, you know, he, he um, in the entrance into the Brotherhood in that one scene, um, like I said before, it, it, the, the O'Brien presents it sort of as uh, just the same, the same scheme, just in different hands, a different power relationship, right? And um, and so o, o, there's sympathy there, but O'Brien's um, where O'Brien doesn't end up being a uh, positive or hopeful or a solution. Um, it, it's because the, uh, the, the, the power relationship it doesn't, it doesn't change modality, it doesn't change method, it just changes the, uh, the people, the, the Democrats and Republicans, right? Um, have you ever seen the bumper sticker? I don't believe this, by the way, but it, the, the bumper sticker that says Democrats, uh, in, for Republicans, it's man against man, for Democrats, it's man against man. Right, it's the same, the same thing. Um, I don't think that that's true, but um, but that's the idea: is that um, that that there's a mirror image there. I see, um, and, but then it's complicated by the sympathy between the two men. A historical question for anyone: um, Is 1984? a product of the Cold War, or is it a rejection of it? Can you tell me? Um, I understand that uh, Orwell coined the word Cold War in one of his essays, but, but he, he's, he's, he's just saying, or experiencing the very beginning of the Cold War, and mm -hmm. he dies in 49, right? Um, so he wouldn't see what would happen in, you know, in the 1950s, but, um, but certainly, um, we have the beginning there, uh, you know, in 1984 we have a separation of the world into three, you know, it's, uh, you know, Oceania, uh, uh, East Asia, East Asia and Eurasia. Yeah, yeah. Eurasia, East Asia. And yeah. so, oh, you know, and so he, certainly he's, he's drawing from, you know, the post-war splitting of, uh, between church, the meeting between Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt, mm -hmm. um, who essentially are divvying up the world. Um, mm -hmm. There is certainly a lot more of the world beyond that, but certainly he yeah. he started to see in question kind of that that will to power or at least the division of powers in in, in the world, mm -hmm. um, which would become the Cold War. It's, yeah, it's yeah. I mean, he's essentially extrapolating. He's writing this um, right at the end of World War II, right, and he's extrapolating into the 50s and 60s. He refers to the atomic war of the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that he's extrapolating what is current in his situation forward. Um, and I had another thought, but I lost it for a second. <laughs> Someone else? I have a question. Go ahead. Oh, oh. oh. oh go ahead. Uh, hello? Hello? Oh, hey. go ahead. Another question. <coughs> I'll, I'll, I'll think of what I was going to say also on that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so. <laughs> 
So uh, the original question, as I understand, was how does Orwell leave us with forms of rebellion? And my question is, is that um, in, at the end of the book where um, Winston's three forms um, or rebellion are taken away, which are his memory, his language, mm -hmm. and finally his human feeling. Is that is is that is that what Orwell is saying that these are the three things that we need, not necessarily to actively act on, but to just have as human beings in order for something like 1984 to not happen in our world. Yeah, I, I think you've nailed it on the head. <laughs> um, so yeah. uh, certainly, you know, I was talking about the proles and. Um, and you know, there's this caricature of working class life, and but one of the th one of the things that, or that Winston says at some point is that you know they've been able to retain their humanity, mm -hmm. um, and so certainly that's what Orwell is pointing to. He he is he's certainly experienced in his life um, the dehumanizing power, and um, and so this question of what is human and what is the individual is important. The proles have retained their humanity, and through that humanity, perhaps something can generate in terms of resistance. That would be one part. The language is the other one. I mean, that's a really, uh, in fact, I think language is, is the big part of the novel. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's all lang about language and political language and truth and so on. And so, the reduction, yeah, reduction, the reduction of vocabulary, yeah. very important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the reduction of, you know, new speak is a reduction of language, which is to say the reduction of expression, the ex yeah. reduction, reduction of, of thought. thought. Right, right. Um, and, um, and so, I mean, one of the interesting parts is that Winston is, uh, is very good at his work. He's very creative in changing history and rewriting history. Um, so it's a kind of a creative job for this intellectual, right. and um, and you have Apple. It's an Applethorpe who is the poet who is rewriting poetry, who is very well, very good at rewriting poetry into right. newspeak and reduction. Right. right. You know, there there can't you can't have the ideas of love because it's not a newspeak, so it has to be changed and translated in some way. Mm -hmm. So he, he does point to how creativity can generate <laughs> some. Can can create something. Of course, it's it's for the purposes of the party, but it can also be um, it could be for the purposes of resistance to the party. Right. Is what I think he's pointing to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This. Sorry about this, but the, we have a public figure who speaks newspeak, virtually. <laughs> um, <laughs> the president of the United States. And I, I remember. Um, I remember what I was going. What I was thinking. Uh, in addition to your question. Um, the, the, one of the interesting things in the exposition in Goldstein's book, there's a large section in the middle which is Goldstein's book, and, um, and in the exposition of the historical circumstances that led to the geopolitical situation, he identifies a, a square in the middle that uh, goes from Hong Kong to Tangier to Forget yeah. the other two places, right? And and that is really the only substantial or a, a, a visible reason why the wars actually go on is for control of that. And none of the three super uh, nations ever completely control it, but they're always fighting for it. And the only reason to fight for it is that there there's lots of cheap labor there. But if if one nation, he says, were to control all of that cheap labor, it really wouldn't make any difference. It wouldn't make a difference to the economy. But that's, that's, the, that's the ostensible reason that they're at constant war. Um, and uh, I think that that's kind of interesting um, and, and insightful. I, I think that there's some truth there, and, it's, and to the extent that there's truth there, there, it's more true now than it was then. Yeah, uh, I, I could uh, maybe um, answer um, your last question and tie it in with yours. So one of the things that Orwell seems to have predicted with uncanny um, precision, I don't, I'd almost call him a prophet, is the effect of unrelenting warfare. Uh, it could, it could yeah. be warfare fought over um, third world countries. And in fact, isn't that interesting that uh, the major powers uh, fight proxy wars, Vietnam or right, whatever, right? right? Mm -hmm. You just fight right. proxy wars. And you, you have 
the population is constantly subjected to warfare. You know, like, like today, for example, we, we are actually afraid, very much afraid of missiles being directed at us from one country or another, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so do governments uh, obtain um, too much power or too much control over populations if there's a state of constant warfare? Yeah, to um, use your um, idea. And so under, under constant warfare, your mind, your feelings, your thoughts, your independent judgment are always subordinated to the, what the powers call the good of the nation, the good of the whole. And if you uh, protest against Big Brother, you are undermining the, war, the, the state of war readiness. Mm -hmm. So now we, we don't even have to fight those proxy wars necessarily. We've got the war on terror, right? How do you know when you won that? Who do, you, who do you kill to win that one, right? So now we have a you know, continual renewal of the Patriot Act, uh, these kinds of things that allow yeah. more and more uh, encroachment to our lives so that maybe nobody's monitoring our emails and phone conversations and texts. Maybe they are. That's the panopticon, right? Uh, not knowing. We know that, that, that the technology is there to monitor, yeah. uh, but we, do, we have no certainty of knowing. So perhaps we decide to be good little boys and girls. There is absolutely no doubt that the ability is there. But when, if anybody's watching at any given moment, we don't know. Yeah. Even with the drones, we have already too much uh, footage from our, our drones uh, to even for human beings to survey that footage. So we have computer programs established to actually review the video footage that we have of the drones that are flying. So it's, uh, yeah. yikes. And, and, and see, don't be afraid to ask questions. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> you know, the whole idea of political correctness is very interesting in that respect, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's up with the lights. What? May I rephrase my question since I was corrected about the Cold War? Could the question be rephrased as, is 1984 a product of the 30s and the World Wars or a rejection of it? And if either of those two, in what ways does that manifest itself? Well, I think we answered that on some level. Um, well, maybe I can just, uh, Orwell wrote an, an essay in, in the 1940s, Notes on Nationalism, and, uh, and he compares, uh, or he writes about patriotism and nationalism. Patriotism, he, which is contrary to what we might think, he's, he saw as a positive, it's a, a faith in, you know, the local and the community, the, the ideals of the community. Um, nationalism, he thought, was a problem. Which it, he saw it as a as a, as a um, desire for power, um, and nationalism being, you know, you you identify with a group or a nation, and you have an identity as for that group or a nation. So it could happen on a national level, but it could also happen on a very local level too. How and the important part is that you would you would sink your individuality into the collective. Yeah. You would sink your individuality into the collective. And once you do that, you can do any number of things because it's for, it's for the collective, for the party. Um, so in any case, and just to get to your question, certainly he, he's seeing how that occurs in Nazi Germany, um, where you have, you know, where there, these individuals, are, they sink their identity into Nazism, and under the, the, the flag of Nazism, they're able to do any number of terrible things. Um, uh, so. He, he equated um, nationalism with some level of dishonesty as well. Um, so, so, yeah, yeah. So, so that certainly would be just one precedent for, for how he, um, you know, the translation of nationalism um, like Germany's um, into the novel. Yeah. yeah, I think, just to add, I think that Einstein was a little bit more extreme in, than Orwell, but Einstein said in re reflecting back on his renunciation of his German citizenship, he said that all that is valuable in human society depends upon the opportunity for development accorded the individual, and that nationalism is an infantile disease, the measles of mankind. Yeah. 
Yes. Question. Question. Um, so Tony Morrison does a wonderful job of beloved of, of talking about memory and remembering. And a student over here said brilliantly, I think, the idea that rebellion has only hope in memory and language and love. And um, I'm just thinking about what you guys are saying in terms of the Patriot Act and, and the fact that we're working in 140 characters now in text <laughs> mode and we've got Google to answer everything so we can't, have, we don't need to remember anything. Um, and so I guess I, I wonder, is it inevitable that we're going to just sort of march to the tune of the proles, um, or does there need to be some form of rebellion? Yes, <laughs> yes, emphatically yes. I, I, a colleague uh, in a conversation I was having about um, curriculum and pedagogy and so on years ago, uh, we were talking about assessing students' knowledge, and this this colleague said, oh, "I never give my students tests uh, where they have to remember stuff. Why should I ask them to remember stuff that they can Google?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I I think that there's it, no matter how good <laughs> quality Google is. Um, it, is it really smart to have an outboard brain? <coughs> right? Um, I, think, I think that, uh, I think we need to push back uh, at all of this stuff. Yeah. Okay, so we were, we were uh, talking in the class that I'm reading this for, we were told to pick a theme to look for throughout the novel, so I chose warfare and how it's used as a tool of the super states. Oh, sure. And in chapter three of the Goldstein book, he directly says it is a warfare of limited aims between combatants who are unable to destroy one another, have no material cause for fighting, and are not divided by any genuine ideological difference, which is basically what he's been leading up to for the first book and most of the second book. Uh, why do you think he decides to add the Goldstein book in as directly explaining what he's been trying to say? Mm. Rather than just like continuing what he was doing before, which was just sprinkling it in, whereas this is a book directly saying his entire idea. Mm. I can you know, try it. Go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, actually, I, I think there's two questions. One is, what is the book within the book? Why is that there? And the other is um, um, talking about the explanation of warfare in that book. So I, I'd say that the book within the book is very interesting. Um, Orwell, after all, in 1984, he, he's, he's actually writing in novel form what he professed, and I think he said this in a column once, he was, every line that I have written since 1936 has been against totalitarianism and for democratic socialism, as I understand it. So the book within the book is an explanation of how uh, democracies can be uh, subverted or corrupted or, um, 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 or in some way um, fall into the trap of totalitarianism. I think that's the point, right? So. The Goldstein book is a study of how uh, the totalitarian state becomes um, constructed, I would say. And, it, and one of the things that it gets constructed on is, the, is warfare and fear, which goes along with warfare, fear and the um, um, excess consumption of goods by war, right? And. Um, uh, we, we've quoted a lot of uh, modern statistics. One, one of them is that the United States at present is the world's greatest arms supplier. So you can think about that in terms of um, uh, uh, problems in a, in a country like ours where what, what, what does it mean to, to be the world's greatest arms supplier at the, time, at the time when there's so much warfare going on in the world? I, I'll just add that I have the same puzzlement about, uh, the, you know, get, get, 
having it kind of be teased out and and being in Winston's constant state of wonder, what really happened, and how can we know what really happened, and then having it sort of just given to you at that at that point in the plot, um, uh, it, it was kind of it, it bewildering to me as well on first read. Uh, but I think that that's often what is done in storytelling. Um, the uh, usually if my my retired, now retired colleague Bob Duxbury and I used to teach him, you know, Bob Duxbury, of course, uh, we used to team teach, and he was a screen writer. He, he wrote plays and, and studied screenwriting, and, and he could tell, he knew the screenwriter's manual well enough to be able to tell you on what page any, a particular plot point would happen. You know, when the, the, the main protagonist uh, got to their lowest the level of disappointment when they met the their love interest and so on and and so this is often if you look at movies th this is a fairly standard technique i think um it, it, the 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 backstory the the context and conditions under which we're operating is teased out and you are uh, it, information is doled out a little in piecemeal in situ and then you have somebody exposit it so you can put all the pieces together. So I actually kind of uh, liked it that way. <laughs> it, it, it helps put it all together. Here yeah, it seems like it does Walker. connect with uh, the known and the unknown, yeah. like you're saying, that it's uh, another way for Winston to at least potentially verify his understanding or his knowledge and whether or not he can, that information can be trusted right. is another question. Right. Sure. So, okay. so, yeah. so here we are. <laughs> it's 122. Yeah. That yeah, was so fascinating. Eric, I want to talk to you about O'Brien well, being a reference. Okay. All right. I'm going to write. Yeah, so. I'm really curious about it. Okay. Go ahead and Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Much. Thank Thanks you. Everybody.